Now that we've established how to get people to be in your study via a sampling method, it's time to talk about experimental design. Now, if you're doing an observational study, there's really no design that you have to think about because you're probably just asking people a question. But if you're doing an experiment where you're imposing some kind of treatment, it's really important that you think through the design carefully so as to minimize bias. There are four principles of experimental design that we're going to focus on in this video, and we're going to see them by looking at some actual examples. To start with, there is some vocab that we need to know. Pause the video and just read experiment A. So there's some vocab that I'd like to highlight here that's going to be really important as we talk about experiments. The people or the things that you are doing the experiment on are called experimental units. And if they happen to be human beings, you call them subjects. So in this case, our students are the units. And since they're human beings, we will call them subjects. But just for the record, they don't have to be humans. You could do an experiment on the plants that are sitting on your deck or you know, on the bacteria growing in petri dishes. Like There's lots of different experimental units. We just happen to be talking about humans in this case. The factor is the thing that you are changing. So we have three different classes. So the class is considered the factor. And of that factor, we have three different levels. One level is a regular class, so just a single teacher. Another level is regular with assistance, so you have one paraprofessional. And then the third level is a small class, so one teacher but fewer students. So the factor is the thing that is changing, and the level is the different ways you can change that factor. So like a middle school science project, for example, let's say you have like 10 bean sprouts, and the first two you don't water at all, the next two you water with tap water, the next two you use distilled water, the next two you use like diet Sprite or something, and you're going to see which um, watering method works the best. The factor is the thing you are using to water, and the levels would be tap water, no water, distilled water, Sprite, whatever other things you want to water it with. Another important vocab word we need to know is treatment. So the treatment is what's actually happening to the subjects or the experimental units. In this case, the treatment is a student is being placed in a class and then they are learning in that class for the year. The last piece of vocab that I'll mention is a response variable. So that's the thing that you are measuring. In this case, it looks like it's a very long-term study. In later years, um, the scientists look at standardized test scores, whether or not they failed, um, who had better high school grades. Those are all response variables. It's what you're measuring in response to the different treatments that you imposed. So now let's take a look at the four principles of experimental design. So the first one is comparison. Comparison of treatments must be present in any experiment. This one is so obvious that it wasn't in older versions of my textbook. They didn't mention it at all, but now the College Board mentions it. Um, you have to be comparing. Otherwise, what's the point of doing the experiment? You have to be comparing at least two treatments. Clearly, there is comparison present in experiment A. The second principle of experimental design is control. And the reason we need control is to minimize the effect of a lurking variable. So usually the way this is done is with a control group in which um, one of the treatments is a placebo, which is basically a sham treatment or a fake treatment. So the common example of a placebo is in like a medical example. Like, let's say we have a new medication for headaches. Um, the people in the control group would get a placebo pill, which might be like a sugar pill, um, that doesn't actually do anything for their headaches, but it's important that we have that placebo group so we can compare them to the people who got the new medication. They're kind of like our baseline or our normal group that we can compare to. The reason they have to take a placebo pill instead of just doing nothing is they have to feel like they are also getting a treatment. The people getting the placebo don't know that it's not real. Now sometimes it's impossible to give a placebo or a sham treatment. For example, experiment A. What would a sham treatment look like for a bunch of kindergartners? This is your fake teacher, here's your fake classroom, you're about to get a fake education for a year, and we'll compare you to the people who got a real education. Yeah, that's not, that's not going to work. So sometimes it's impossible to have a true control group with a sham treatment. 
Now you could consider this regular class to be the control group, but many schools would say this isn't 25 students isn't regular, that's small. In cases where you can't have a true placebo, comparison of several treatments in the same environment can be a form of control. So this same environment is how you control for lurking variables. So take a moment and think about experiment A. What types of things should we try to control so that the different treatments are as similar as possible? So here are some things that I thought of. Um, we want to make sure the teachers are as similar as possible. So we've got these three different classes with three different teachers. We'd want to make sure that those three teachers have similar training, um, have similar experience levels, right? We don't want one teacher to be brand new and one teacher to be like a veteran who's about to retire um, because we don't want one class to do better because they had a better teacher. We might also want to make sure the teachers are of the same like demographic, same gender, age, etc. And then we'd also want the classrooms to be as similar as possible, like the same size. If one classroom is really cramped and one is really spacious, like that might change whether or not students are successful. Same types of decorations, you know, are there motivational posters everywhere? Are students seeing themselves represented on the walls of the classroom? Um, desk arrangement, are they in groups? Are they in pairs? Are they sitting totally separate from each other? There's all these other factors and we want to make sure the only difference between our three treatments are the three different levels that we have identified. Now, hopefully you can see how impossible this is. Any experiment where you're dealing with humans and any experiment when you're dealing with human children, it's really hard. It's really hard to make it a truly like well-designed, perfect experiment. You can think of all these things in theory, but in practice, it's hard. The third principle of experimental design is replication. And this is the act of reducing chance variation between experimental units. With replication, we want to reduce the natural variability that will happen no matter how controlled the experiment is. So even if we manage to find three teachers that are virtually identical and three classrooms that are virtually identical, those kids are going to be different. <laughs> so basically with replication, what we want to do is increase the number of experimental units as much as possible, which is just going to decrease that chance variation between the different experimental units. It does not mean that we increase the number of experiments. We're not doing this experiment a hundred times. It means we want to get as many subjects as possible in the experiment. So for experiment A, in order to have replication be present, we would want to include as many students as possible. I think they have like 6,000 some students. That's, that's a lot. All right, the last principle of experimental design is randomization. This is the act of assigning a treatment to subjects randomly. So this is arguably the most important because it allows us to say that there is no systematic difference between the treatments. Now for experiment A, in order to have randomization present, we would have to randomly assign each student to one of the three treatments. They cannot select which treatment they would prefer. With this experiment, I think it's pretty easy to see why we would have a problem if students or parents could select which treatment they wanted. The most vocal parents are going to get their students in the perceived best class, which I would say is probably the one that has the smallest class size. The really vocal parents are going to ask that their students be put in the small class. And so what you're going to end up with is only students in the small class who have parents who are very active in their child's education. So at the end of the study, we can't tell if the students in the small class did better because they were in a small class or because their parents were super involved in their education. So here's another example of how experimenting on humans, specifically human children, is super challenging. Because if you tell most parents, we're going to randomly assign your student to a regular class or a small class, parents aren't going to be cool with that. They're going to want the small class. Which is why if you're ever reading an experiment about human children or about education, there's, it's probably not going to be a perfect experimental design because education is important and you don't want to mess that up for kids. Sometimes there's a theoretical experimental design that's perfect and then there's a practical experimental design that, that is actually realistic for the real world. Okay, so I have two more experiments here, experiment B and C. Um, we'll just go through B in this video and then C, I'll post the answers so you can do that as extra practice if you want. So for B, um, why don't you pause the video, read through this, and try to answer questions 1 through 7 as best as you can, and then we'll go over the answers together.
Okay, so this is based on a real study. You can click that link and read it if you want. I've got the answers on the right here. Our experimental units are the students, and because they are human beings, they are considered subjects. The factor is what they were told about their drink, and the two levels are either being told they have an alcoholic drink or told they are having a non-alcoholic drink. The treatment is everyone gets a non-alcoholic drink after they are told what they are getting. Okay, so for control, we could consider the control group to be the group that was told they were getting the non-alcoholic drink, um, and then their results at the end of the experiment could be used as the baseline score. And then just to control for other lurking variables, we would also want to make sure that everyone gets the same amount to drink, um, the same type of drink, they are in the same environment, like everything else needs to be as similar as possible. So that is important to note with control. There's a control group, which sometimes you can have and sometimes you can't. And then there's also controlling for lurking variables, which is where you do everything in your power to make sure that there are no other differences between the different treatments. Okay, for replication, the researchers would just have to do this with as many students as possible. 148 seems like a lot, especially if they're doing this all at once. That is a lot of students to be all in one place. Randomization. Um, the students would have to be randomly assigned to either a tonic or a vodka tonic. The researchers can't just pick based on some physical feature of the person. They can't tell the first 50 they're getting alcoholic drinks and the last 50 they're not because maybe there's a difference in the people who come in first versus the people who come in last. It has to be randomly assigned. Number seven is really important. This is why we do each of these things, or why they make the results of the experiment trustworthy. Control gives us a baseline so that we can compare the two groups, but it also ensures that the bias due to a lurking variable um, is as small as possible. Replication reduces the variation between the participants and it ensures that our results will happen no matter who is in the experiment. And then randomization ensures that there's no pattern to who ended up in each group. So here's an example of what would be bad. If all the people who normally drink a lot didn't end up in the vodka tonic group, that might be a source of bias. So if you'd like to do experiment C, I will post this answer key in the video description so that you can do that as extra practice. But for now, we are going to quickly talk about um, the lurking variables that I was just mentioning. So a lurking variable is a variable that is lurking dramatically in the background that you don't intend to study, but might accidentally influence your response. Confounding happens when the association between the response and the lurking variable cannot be distinguished. So for example, let's say a study finds that a medication reduces the risk of a dangerous disease. So our explanatory variable is the medication, how much you're taking, or whether or not you're taking it. And then the response is um, the amount of risk that that person has for the certain disease. Some examples of confounding uh, might be the number of visits to the doctor. So maybe people who visit the doctor more have a reduced risk of getting that disease. It doesn't have to do with the medication. Maybe it's how often they visit the doctor. Maybe it has to do with age or diet or exercise habits. There's tons of things that a person could do um, in their everyday life that would make them less or more at risk of a dangerous disease. Here's a classic example. There's a positive association between ice cream sales and drowning. When ice cream sales go up, the number of drownings also goes up. Well, the confounding issue here is the heat or the temperature outside. When it's hotter outside, people are going to buy more ice cream, and when it's hotter outside, people are going to drown more often because they are swimming more often. Here's another example. A study finds that there's a strong correlation between the number of firefighters on the scene and the amount of damage done to a burning building. Like, hey, when we send more firefighters to the scene, there's more damage done to the building. These darn firefighters. No, well, that's not really true. Confounding is the severity of the fire. If the fire is more intense, you're going to send more firefighters, and there's also going to be more damage on the building. So a confounding or lurking variable is a variable that is somehow related to the explanatory response variable and might influence the response variable to create a false association between the explanatory and the response. These are two kind of, I don't want to say silly because the first one's about drowning and the second one is about severe fires, but kind of extreme examples of lurking variables. In experiment A, we identified a lot of possible lurking variables like teacher experience, classroom setup, um, parent involvement in the student's education. When you're dealing with humans, it's, it's really hard to make them similar and get rid of all lurking variables.
which I think is the key of this unit. There is the theoretical experiment that you can design perfectly to minimize all possible sources of bias, and then there's the practical experiment that you can actually execute. In reality, when you're planning an experiment, you just have to do the best you can do and try to have all four principles of experimental design present. It's not gonna be perfect, but you can make it as close to theoretically perfect as possible.